Hey, PT Pop here. All four lobes of my brain completely bound behind my back. And today I'm starting a new series of videos called Are You Woke? Stay tuned. At the tone, press 1 for murder. If you like my videos, give me the thumbs up. Subscribe. I've got a couple books for sale, but my most recent one is called Press 1 for Murder. It's a murder mystery book I wrote inspired by my time working in call centers across the country. I've been watching a lot of videos online about becoming woke. And it's, uh, I don't know if it's included in the Webster's Dictionary, but it's a slang term in the 21st century about individuals who have become aware of the reality around them, to put it simply. W-O-K-E is a modern term meaning kind of coming to your senses coming out of the matrix and seeing everything as kind of a make-believe lie. Are you woke? Are you coming to see your senses and seeing that the things you've been taught and the things that you have been led to believe are false? You can't believe in your government. You can't believe in your society. You can't believe in the guy next door because everybody's living like this little fantasy world. Everybody is. I mean, everybody's living this little, like, make-believe world. And I'm not talking about the people that are chasing after Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster. I'm talking about people that are pursuing these things in life that are just aren't, aren't even achievable. Or, or they are achievable, but they're really, you know, society has this thing where they indoctrinate you into believing into mysterious mytholo mythological creatures and fairy tales. And they also like to dangle a carrot in front of your nose. They'll dangle a carrot in front of your nose and get you to keep chasing and chasing and chasing. And when you're just about to grab the carrot, they pull it away from you. If you look around you, there's people all around us, friends, family members, relatives, strangers, that have that thousand mile stare in their eyes. You know, they're like, You know today? Ah, oh, you know, they got that far away look in their eyes. I'm going to work today. What are you doing? Really? Ah, oh, I just bought a Mercedes. I got married. I have 2.5 kids. You know, they got that look in their eyes like they've been to war. Like they've seen bloody bodies, you know, on the beach. And they've been to war and they've seen horrible things. Look around you, a lot of people have that look in their eyes. It's just like they, they've just seen some bad stuff, man. Or they're just so deeply uh, drugged up by the lies that they've been told. They're just so into their life. They're so into being somebody or being that guy in society who has the Mercedes and the and the 4,000 square foot home, and the 2.5 kids and the Labrador retriever at the pick a white fence outside. And they're just like, I believe. You ever watch Popeye, the old Popeye cartoons? There was this woman that used to chase Popeye around. Now these are the Popeye cartoons from like the 1930s. And she was called Alice the Goon. And she would walk around, I love Popeye. That's all she would say, I love Popeye. And she'd chase Popeye all around because she was like a stalker. She was, you know, the equivalent of Glenn Close in uh, Fatal Attraction. You know, she's always boiling uh, Popeye's bunny. And that's what people are, are like around here. They're chasing, not, not around here physically where I am, but there's a lot of people who are chasing after dreams. You know, they're saying, I love Popeye. I love working in the corporate world, do you? I love working. I love working at Drug Mart. It saves me the runaround. Ah. Do you like do working in the corporate world? world? Do you love do you it? Love I love it. it. I've got 2.5 kids, do you? Do you? I have a Mercedes, Mercedes and a 4,000 square foot home, home, but I hate I my, my husband. husband. He beats me in night, but I stay because I got the house. house. And the car. And the house. And the dogs. And the kids. And this isn't just a new thing. This is this has been going. My mom went through. It. My mom and dad both. They were both victims of this whole uh, fairy tale syndrome. I called it picket white fantasy. But look around you. People have the picket white fantasy syndrome. They got the thousand mile stare. Hi Pete. Hi, Pete. How, are How are you today? today? Really? really? I hate I, Donald I, Trump. Do you hate Donald Trump? Trump? I hate, I hate Hillary Clinton. Because they tell me to hate. hate. They tell me to hate, so I hate. I, 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 I love, I love heroin. heroin. Do you love heroin? heroin. <sighs> I hate I what hate they tell me to hate. hate. I love I what love they tell me to love. love. I, wear I wear what they tell me to wear. I love, I love all sports athletes. I love all TV shows. 
I love cars. Don't you love fancy cars that you can't afford? And big houses that I don't need? For some reason, I need a 4,000 square foot house, even though I have no kids and only $100,000 in the bank. But the bank gave it to me. I love it. So indoctrinated to the ways of the world. As far back as I can remember, especially in junior high school, I would, I remember leaning up against the wall, just watching people, you know, watching classmates desperately try to fit into little cliques. The jocks trying to be jocks. The burnouts hanging out in a cloud of cigarette and pot smoke in front of the high school, desperately trying to be part of that crowd in their leather jackets and their Iron Maiden t-shirts. You know, everybody was trying to be somebody, as we all were. But I kind of, I kind of orbited around the outer fringes. I had a, I had a few close friends that were more like little rats. They kind of sniveled, sniveled around, you know, until the cheese ran out. Then they ran away. They were no longer friends. When they found out they could no longer use me or take advantage of me, they t they hit the road. When I was of no use to them, so they were like rats. And that's how I see my former friends from high school. <laughs> little rats, just awful people. And, um, but I would sit back and I watch these people desperately trying to fit into the, 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 the jock clique or the burnout clique or the, the, uh, thespian clique. There were a lot of thespians in my class. They don't want to be actors. I'm going to be an actor and be a thespian, you know? And I would sit back and watch them desperately trying to cling to this group or that group or this person or that person. And it continued on through college. You know, you see all these, you go to college and you see people trying to desperately fit in in college. They join fraternities, they join sororities. I joined a fraternity. But, it, you know, it was a different type of fraternity. It wasn't your typical, you know, like, I'm a beta and you're, you're nothing. You know, we were just kind of a bunch of regular guys that hung out in one house, you know. There was none of this um, hierarchy or I'm better than you, that kind of thing. Um, but if you think about our earliest indoctrinations into this world, we're indoctrinated to believe a certain way, to think a certain way, to talk a certain way, to approach things a certain way. And it's instilled in our minds at a very early age. And this it comes in the form of us believing in magical, you know, fairy tales. We believe in magical imaginary creatures. And my earliest memories of this magical creature um, indoctrination was the Easter Bunny. I'll never forget this. I was four years old. It was Easter Sunday morning, and I had been told by my family, pre predominantly, you know, my I'm the youngest of four. My older siblings and my parents told me there would be this magical creature that would show up on Sunday morning and bring me a basket full of chocolate. Okay. And I remember as a little kid thinking, that's kind of strange. You know, I'm kind of like a Spock type person. I kind of really analyze things. Even as at a young age, I really was like, hmm, something doesn't sound quite right here. And, um, I, you know, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, I'm thinking, where is this magical creature going to come from? Where is he, how is he going to get in the house? And, I'd ask these questions. I said, well, don't worry. He'll get in the house. He'll get in the house. He'll leave you a basket of chocolate under your bed or something. So it's Sunday morning. We wake up. And my sister, who is 13 years older than me. So I'm four. So she's like 17. She runs to the living room window. We lived in Cleveland Heights at the time. We, we run to the, not the living room window, the dining room window. On the... Uh, north side of our house and there was a little side street on the side of the house and there was a small bit of uh, lawn we had and it was covered in a fresh layer of snow now this is easter sunday this is april or whatever it is and in cleveland it snows until like august 2nd or something it snows like year round here it seems sometimes and she's like look pete look out the window and i, I run to the window i'm like what she's like look there's rabbit tracks out in the snow and I'm looking, I remember, I'll never forget looking out there. Like, she's to my right. I'm looking out there, and I can barely see over the windowsill because I'm like four years old. I'm like, there's rabbit tracks out there? She's like, yeah, it's the Easter Bunny. He's brought your chocolate. I'm like, what? And I remember if, if I had the ability to, to speak or act like an adult at the age of four, I would have said, 
this bitch is crazy. You know, I would have been thinking, I, I remember thinking this is really where she's being really weird. This is really odd. Cause I'm looking out in the snow and there's absolutely nothing out in the snow except snow and blades of grass sticking through the snow because there's like a quarter inch dusting of snow on, on the lawn. And I'm like, there's no tracks out there, sis. And she's like, oh yeah, look right there. Look right there. Oh, look, at, we'll get the, the little kid to believe in crap. That was my first indoctrination to the magical creature syndrome, I call it. They, they, get us, they start getting you to believe in magical creatures and fairy tales. And this, I'm lead, this is what, what I'm leading to eventually in this little diatribe of mine is I think this is what leads to a lot of heartache and mental distress in our society, but I'll get to that later. So my next indoctrination was Christmas. Now it seems like every Christian holiday they have around the Western civilization seems to go hand in hand with some type of magical imaginary creature that they want you to believe in. Christmas has Santa Claus, this magical obese man that puts some type of magic dust in his nose and he comes down the chimney, eats your cookies, drinks your milk and leaves you packages. And Easter has the magical rabbit, the magical rabbit that hops into the house somehow and leaves you a basket full of chocolate. But then there's no mention in my family at the time of crucifixions or Jesus or Christianity or Bibles. We didn't go to church. We weren't, we weren't church going people. We were um, people stayed at home on Sundays because mom and dad were passed out drunk on the floor. That's the kind of people we were. So Christmas comes and I'm told about this magical man. He's going to come down the chimney. He's going to bring me all kinds of goodies. Oh, and I'm, I remember, see, so I'm, I'm the Spock type person at this age. And I'm like, I remember my dad telling me this. And I'm like, hmm. So dad, how is this guy going to get down the chimney without getting burned? when you've got a fire in that fireplace, because we always had a fire burning in this fireplace because uh, mom and dad had no money to run the furnace, I guess, because uh, all, the, all the money was going uh, over the teeth and past the gums, look out, stomach, here it comes, you know. Um, all, all the money was going into their stomachs in the form of vodka and whiskey. I'm sitting here thinking, this is crazy. There's no way some guy's gonna come down the chimney without getting his ass burned off by the fire that's in there. My dad's like, well, he'll put some magical dust. You know, he's got some magic. He's magical, and he'll just, uh, you know, he'll hop over the fire or something. I don't know what it was. You know, they all tell us this crap in all Western civilization. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, this is great, because, you know, as a little kid, I know we're poor as dirt, because up to this point, at the age of four, all I had to eat was buttered crackers. We'd have butter crackers for breakfast and we'd have buttered saltine crackers, maybe a little jelly for lunch. And maybe if we were lucky, a chicken pot pie for dinner. We didn't have any food. And I was, we were so poor and I was so hungry. I remember I had this dream that I was, I was I'll never forget this dream. I'm four years old. And in the dream, I would go to bed hungry every night. I remember this because I would dream about food. And in this one dream, I dreamed of a hamburger. And in this dream, this hamburger appeared in the darkness. It was just a pitch black room. And this hamburger appeared floating above me in this dream, you know. And I reached out to grab it and eat it, and it disappeared. Christmas morning comes. comes. And all I get was a bag of underwear and some socks. And I'm like, what happened to this magical man it's supposed to bring me all my toys and all the things I've ever wanted, you know? I remember I'd asked for an Apollo rocket because the Apollo moon landing had just happened and, you know, all that stuff. And I'd ask for all these toys. I said, so what do you want for Christmas? You know, they sit down with you. Well, it would be more like, hey, what, what do you want for Christmas, Pete? Would you like that Apollo moon rocket? Oh, okay, all right. All right, well, yeah, well, Santa Claus, I'll bring it for. I think my dad was really hoping that there was a Santa Claus because he knew damn well he wasn't going to get me an Apollo rocket model because he, all the money was in his stomach in the form of vodka. So he's probably like, oh, God, I hope there's a, I hope there's a Santa Claus, because this little guy's not getting a power rocket. He's getting a bag of underwear and some socks. You know, so I'm opening up my gifts. I get, I get underwear and socks. And I'm like, where the hell's the Apollo rocket? Where's this magical man? And, and who took the bite out of the cookie next to the fireplace with the orange juice, you know? So that so I, I I have always questioned this reality that they've tried to teach us. I've always questioned 
the existence of most things that they, they try to indoctrinate us into believing, you know. Santa Claus, Easter bunnies, leprechauns, you know. <laughs> you know, St. Patrick's Day was another one. I mean, I'm not Irish. I don't think I'm like this much Irish, little tiny bit. And, um, <sighs> you know, there are people in the world that believe in leprechauns, just like they believe in Bigfoot. I'm not even going to get into the Bigfoot alien thing. There's probably more chance that there's aliens than there's a Bigfoot. Or or mermaids or unicorns. But the whole thing I'm, I'm getting at here, they, they get you believing, they get your belief system going. And it's, anything's possible, anything's possible. There's magical creatures that'll bring you gifts and, and answer all your wishes and you'll be so happy. Then there's the Tooth Fairy. Oh no, they bring the Tooth Fairy in. I remember the Tooth Fairy. Oh my God. I remember how I lost my first tooth. We lived on this, we lived in this abandoned house in the country. We were homeless. Long story, we were homeless and this friend of the family owned this abandoned house. His bank owned the house. This guy owned a bank and he, he let us live in this house and he fixed it up a little bit. And uh, long story short, there was an apple orchard or some apple trees next door to this house. So we go from living in the city, the suburbs of Cleveland to living in the country. And I bite into this green apple and one of my front top teeth pops out and sticks in the apple. I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, ah, I can't swear in here because YouTube will spank me. <laughs> um, so my tooth comes out, you know, you go in the house and it's like, oh, the tooth fairy's gonna bring you money. So I'm thinking, oh no, not a magical, another magical creature that's gonna do magical things for me, you know, like, Money, you know, money was a big issue in my family too because we had none. So there was always, there was always this, this, this panic to find money, find ways to have money so you could pay the bills so we wouldn't get evicted, so we, you know, we could, wouldn't have the lights shut off and stuff. And uh, so I'm like, oh yeah, another magical creature. And they like, go upstairs tonight and put your tooth under your pillow. And some magical creature called the Tooth Fairy is going to show up and give you money. Okay, all right, Mom, Dad. So I'm starting to get a good idea to what alcohol does to your brain at this age because they're, they're believing in these magical creatures too because I don't know where they're going to get the money to give me. Keep in mind, this is like 1970, 71, somewhere around. This is the summer of, I think this is the summer of 70, maybe the fall. So I'm not, I'm still four years old or something, or maybe, maybe this is the following summer. I don't remember the actual chronological thing. So I go upstairs, you know, put my tooth on my pillow, wake up the next day and there, you know, and there's like, my tooth is gone. And there's like, I don't know, 50 cents under my pillow, which in today's money is like three bucks or something. <laughs> it's like nothing. I don't know. I don't know where they got the 50 cents put under my pillow. They probably, my dad probably stole it from, uh, you know, the March of Dimes canister at the local convenience store. So, my whole point is, is that our society starts you off in believing in magical things. They, they indoctrinate the young mind into believing in fantasies, folklore, um, make-believe, anything's possible. If you wish, you dream, if you click your heels, there's no place like home. The Wizard of Oz type of mentality. And then, then they th on top of all that, they throw in God. <laughs> Which I consider God and Christ and all that stuff to be another one of the magical creatures that they, they try to indoctrinate you about. I call him the magical man in the clouds because I'm, and I'll never forget, as a kid again, down on my knees next to the bed with my dad, down on his knees, and he's got his hands like these. He's like, okay, we're going to say our prayers. No, I didn't talk like that, but um, we're going to say our prayers. Now you repeat after me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to take. That part, I'm like, what? If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord a soul to take. What? What? What is this stuff, Dad? I kind of, oh, death. What is death? You mean I might die tonight when I go to sleep? Who's the Lord and what's a soul and how's he going to take it and where he's going to put it? Oh, don't worry about that, son. Oh, young Peter, you're, you ask too many questions. Just say the prayer and I leave you down to sleep. Uh, pray the Lord that he's not a sheep. And if I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take, whatever the hell it is. Oh my God, we're talking about a horrifying prayer. You know, so, th so they start you down the path. 
to get you down the path of bright colors, happy stories, happy, happily ever after, magical creatures, imaginary, imaginary beings. And I know you're saying, well, Pete, you're not really supposed to believe that stuff. Uh, I know that, you know. I knew it at a young age, but I kind of went along with it because I wanted a pile of rocket ship. I wanted some money for my tooth, you know. I wanted a ba basket of chocolate. I don't know what I got that Easter. I have no. I, I think I always got chocolate at Easter. Somehow they managed to give me chocolate. That, I don't know where it came from. They must have had enough money. Dad was probably at the liquor store and they were selling Easter baskets next to the vodka. Or they're giving away Easter baskets for, with every other bottle of vodka you bought or something. I don't know where we got the chocolate from. But my whole point is, look around you right now. We live in a society of, filled with disillusioned people. And people are so disillusioned and they're so broken and they're so shattered that they have decided that there's no other alternative in their lives but to put a needle in their arm and start getting high from heroin or booze, whatever it happens to be. People in our society are inebriated at historic levels across the country. It's in every major city. It's in a lot of the small cities. And they've got each and every one of us believing these magical creatures are going to come save us. And... You know, you've got churches praying to the magical man in the crowd and the clouds to bring sobriety to the drug addicts on the street that are panhandling. You've got now you've got people literally fighting in the streets over the magical creatures that live in DC. <laughs> and, and and the politicians are some of the biggest phonies in the world, and we're all believing them. Oh, President Trump's gonna save us. He's the guy in the white hat. Now, President Trump is a carnival barker, and so is Hillary Clinton. They're all phony, and we've all believed in these people. Oh, they're going to help us. They're going to save us and bring us jobs. This whole thing, our whole society, is saturated with people that are woke. They're starting to wake up. They're starting to see the evil of our society and how we've been programmed to think a certain way. But the minute that programming wears off, the minute that your brain starts to realize that the pursuit of this, the pursuit of that, the magical creatures that you believe in are phony, people are stopped dead in their tracks and they don't know what to do. They don't know what, where to turn to. They're at a crossroads. They're literally at a crossroads and, and they, they, they're given a choice. Continue on the path that they're on, believing what they've been sold and no, even though they know it's a lie, or do they try to, to, to go down another road, take a different choice, or just blaze their own trail through the cornfields that are all around them, you know? And I think what's happening is a lot of people are waking up and seeing that a lot of what we've been sold is a fairy tale. We've been sold fairy tales about magical creatures. We've been sold fairy tales about politicians and presidents. We've been sold fairy tales about ministers and priests and bishops that are supposed to be our saviors. You know, we've been sold fairy tales about all this stuff. Now people are waking up and they don't know what to do. And I bring this up because I see all around me in, in, in Cleveland, there's poverty, there's crime, there's drug addiction, and, it's, and there's people shooting each other and getting into fights in the streets because people are frustrated. They don't know what to do now. They realize that everything they strive for, everything they've, they've sought after is bogus. And I think that people make a couple choices. They're at the crossroads. I, I continue on the path I'm on. Do I just give up and, and put a needle in my arm at the crossroads and fall down the middle of the crossroads? Do I, do I try to do what I've tried to do? I've tried to go do my own business and, and, and be an artist and make money at that, which is a whole nother fairy tale that they try to sell you. That's a fairy tale, too. The whole artist thing is a big fairy tale. Massive. Um... So that's, that's my initial video about becoming woke. We're sold fairy tales. We believe in fairy tales. Our brains get conditioned into believing in the make-believe. And then we pursue the make-believe. And in, in, in my following videos, I'm going to talk about the American dream, working in the corporate world, romance, marriage, relationships, um, and a variety of topics that are all fairy book. Or fairy, fairy book. They're fairy book. Fairy tales. And you've got to believe me. I mean, there's, you start really thinking about the things that we're told, the things we're supposed to strive for, and the things we're supposed to hope for. And how many people actually find them? And once they get them, how many people do we know? We go, you know, I got that big job, but it's, 
It's not quite what I thought it was going to be. I don't like it. Or the people that we all have watched from a distance get famous, you know? The Britney Spears, the Justin Bieber's, the Taylor Swift's, you know, um, Chris Farley's, Robin Williams, people that are severely messed up in the head either before they got famous or after or they started doing drugs. The people I grew up with that all died, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon. Um, you know, I, I don't know all the people. There's a lot of people that unfortunately ran into some really awful circumstances and died because of their fame. They may not have reached that same uh, uh, ultimate demise if they hadn't been famous. But anyway, um, if you really step back and you become an observationalist, like I was in junior high school, and I, literally, I'd lean up against the wall and I'd just watch all these people just desperately trying to fit in and be like, hey man, can I have a cigarette, man? Love your Iron Maiden shirt, you wanna get high later? You know, and a lot of those people that I went to high school with have OD'd, they're gone. At least two or three of them completely gone. Just some have died of heart attacks, some have, have overdosed on drugs, some have been murdered. One got is a major drug addict, got, drug addict got beat to death in a, I think, in a driveway or a parking lot of a bar out in Los Angeles. So anyway, I think it's time we all started working together and becoming woke. We, we've got all we have, all you have, and all I have is each other. That's all we got. And until we start learning to work with each other, and, and put a wall around DC, forget DC. They're, they're the drunken uncle off in the corner that's singing, Davy, Davy Crockett. Hey, look at me with the lampshade on my head. They're, they're, they're beyond, they're beyond saving. <laughs> they're gone. They're completely wasted. They're not even worth putting them into rehab. Their livers are shot. Their brains are gone. <laughs> if you like my videos, give me the thumbs up. Subscribe. I've got a couple books for sale, but my most recent one is called Press One for Murder. It's a murder mystery book I wrote inspired by my time working in call centers across the country. Have a good day. Stay tuned for more woke videos. Bye. At the tone, press one for murder.